It is um, awesome to be here. And it's been my first experience here at this conference. And I have been impressed. Uh, what's impressed me the most is the age. Uh, you know, probably 80% of the people here are under 40 years old. Uh, that, that speaks of hope of the future of the church. Um, so you guys should congratulate yourself. <clears throat> but as you can see, and someone did mention it, and they came to me and they said, Andre, you're overdressed. I am overdressed, but I'm wearing this because I'm cold. This is to keep me warm. I actually went to Angel, who is not speaking with me today. Um, she said, Andre, you can do it on your own. Uh, sorry to disappoint you, but um, I said, I'm so cold. I can't think of anything funny to say. Um, so she said, well, Andre, just tell them uh, the, the story about Jesus. Uh, my experience about um, my encounter that embarrassed me when I talked about Jesus. And so I, I'd like to share that with you. Who here was at World Youth Day in Denver in 19, uh, somehow in the two centuries ago? Who was at World Youth Day in Denver? Okay, there's a couple of us. Most of us are dead. Um, but I remember going to Denver um, and like Angel shared, I, we've been involved in ministry uh, on university campuses since 1988. And back in 1988, some of you remember that for some reason, there was a veil over the eyes of the hearts of many of our people. So the name of Jesus was something that we as Catholics were uncomfortable with. And I saw it on campus. You know, we, one reason we started the movement of Catholic Christian, uh, Christian outreach on campus is that we saw the great multitudes of young Catholics that just walked away with no fanfare. I mean, nobody was, was even aware that they were walking away so easily. But we found that if we go chase them and talk to them about Jesus, that their heart is transformed, meaning Jesus changes lives. And so we wanted the whole church to kind of be set on fire for Jesus. And so as a movement, we were really committed to proclaiming Jesus clearly and simply. And so... We went, I went to Denver with that in mind. I wanted the whole world, the whole church, to be set on fire for Jesus. And so when we got to Mile High Stadium, and uh, the Pope came in, the crowd, there's 80,000 people, 80,000 young people. And when he came in, the crowd went crazy. And I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to be in um, the uh, uh, an audience where the Pope is. I know he came here in 84 or something like that. Um, he knew how to, how to engage the crowd. And so right away, the crowd, you know, sh shouted out, uh, you know, uh, John Paul II, we love you. And then he responded, you know, John Paul II loves you. And so it just went back and forth. But being the holy man that he is, he wanted to move the attention away from himself and onto Jesus. And he said, Jesus loves you. And something happened that was extraordinary in that moment. Is the 80,000 young people shouted out the name of Jesus. I was so moved. I didn't think I'd ever see this happen. That so many young Catholics would just shout out the name of Jesus. The ground shook that day. I, I thought I died and went to heaven. It was an awesome experience. But you know, all good things come to an end. Well, the event came to an end. So I, you know, everyone's leaving the stadium and going to the buses. 
But, you know, being the, the um, motivator that I am, I like to keep the crowd going. I, I thought I came up with a great idea. And so I turned to the crowd of maybe, you know, 40, 50,000 people. And I, and I thought, we're going to keep this going. We're going to keep, you know, Jesus on our lips. And so I turned to the crowd and I said, give me a J. And instantly they knew what I was doing. So the response was, J. And so I had the crowd. So I said, give me an E. And more people gathered, you know, and, and joined in and E. And it, my voice, by the way, it wasn't that affected back then. So the crowd was, you know, we got to J and E. You know, and so I had to bring this home. I, I wanted the crowd to kind of get to that crescendo. and We'd all shout out the name of Jesus. I said, give me a U. And the crowd just is less, but, but they, there was an enthusiasm. Give me a U. And then they responded with a U. And I said, give me an S. And the crowd, you know, again, S. And I, so I had to kind of gather the crowd and get them focused on the name. And I said, what does that spell? And the crowd went silent. And then some person, probably back there, said, I don't know. And the Holy Spirit worked in that moment. He revealed something to me that I had misspelled the name above all names. <laughs> I want you to know today that I'm going to be talking about Jesus, but we will not have a spelling bee. We'll not, I will not ask you to spell anything. I, I would like to talk about prayer today and how to establish a daily prayer time. Because John talked today, John Conley talked today about get yourself formed. By the way, it's hard to follow John Conley, the guy is on fire. But he, he said, get formed, get out there and get yourself formed. Get yourself ready for what God is about to do. There's no better way to form yourself and your children, and that is to establish a daily prayer life, a, a, a communion with Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the Father daily. But before I, I speak of that, I want to talk a little bit about what John, John talked about, but I want to emphasize it and really um, confirm what he was talking about. We are in a missionary age in the church today. An extraordinary time. And I believe, and we are seeing the signs of it on campuses across Canada, that God is doing something extraordinary. We are seeing more men come back than we've ever seen in our history. We are seeing people that are truly on the periphery coming back, meaning there's something happening. But we shouldn't be surprised by it because St. John Paul II actually prepared us for this moment. How many of you remember the year 2000? Yes. Do you remember John Paul II prepared the whole church for three years for the great jubilee of the birth of Christ? Well, I believe that moment, that, that great jubilee, that, that moment in history, as, and John Paul II refers to that moment as a hermeneutical moment in his pontificate, meaning it's a defining moment. So what was it about the year 2000 that is impacting us today. Well, there are some, he wrote prolifery uh, in, in those years leading up to the year 2000, but he, I want to refer to a couple things that he said. One, and they're very prophetic. One is that he spoke of, you know, the great jubilee being this kind of moment in history, this threshold of hope. Now, as we look at the last 20 four years, we're not seeing a lot of hope, a lot of um, good news in the church and in the world around us. It seems like the opposite. But he talked about this new millennium ushering in a millennium of, of hope. 
But he also spoke of this coming of a missionary age. Now, it's really important that we understand what he means by missionary age. You know, for five, six hundred years, the church was strong and established. We were, we were maintaining our people. But he saw a time where we would look more like the early church than we do the church of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. Meaning there's a missionary age that is upon us. Meaning what is going to define the church's task is to be missionary. Meaning reach out to the great multitudes of our people that have wandered away so easily. To our children, to our families. That we are truly in an age where we are wanting to bring the message of the gospel to our people. And we have to be equipped for that moment. But he also spoke of that in the year 2000, a copious amount of grace. Does anybody know what, how much is a copious? A lot, huh? like an extraordinary amount. He said in his words, a copious amount of grace would descend upon the church in the year 2000 in order for the church to fulfill his work of evangelization. My friends, it's taken a while for that grace to, to kind of seep into the church, but we are now in the age where that copious amount of grace is available to us. Because the next thing he said, which I, I want for each and every one of you to be encouraged by these words because they're real and they will have an impact on your children and on your family and on your neighbors and on your parish. John Paul II said this. He said, I see a dawning of a new era, meaning it's in the future, maybe 24 years later, that people would be more open, listen to this, to the sowing of the gospel. Now, for the last 23 years, what defines the world is not openness to the gospel, but the opposite. It seems like a rejection of the gospel, a turning away, a discarding of the gospel. But John Paul II said, we are, there's an age coming upon the church where people would be more open to the sowing of the gospel. My friends, I believe we are stepping into that age right now. We are seeing on campus, and by the way, if you want to know what's going to happen in the next 10 years, go to university campuses and you'll see the sign of the time that will come. And we are seeing on campuses across our country, people that were far away, extraordinarily far away, are coming back in an extraordinary way. It's almost like they are seeing visions in the sky and the Lord is calling them. And their hearts are open. So we are in this an extraordinary time. And this is why John was talking about start preparing yourself. And preparing your children to be fully, fully engaged. Not protecting, as my wife was saying. Let's don't protect ourselves. Cut ourselves off of the world. Let us be... We should be more of a threat to the world than the world is to us. Because Christ is in us. The very life of, of God, the creator of heaven and earth is in us. We should be the greater threat to the world. Let us act. Let's live our full identity. Let us be the ones that are the light of the world, the hope of the nations. And this is a disposition that I want to talk about today but it starts in our prayer life. Our prayer life is ex it's essential for us as individuals. But if you want to safeguard your children from the world, teach them to sit in the presence of God daily. And he will be their disciple. Meaning allow God to be the one that speaks into our children and you daily. Because what prayer is, is not us saying a bunch of things to God, 
But prayer, what the catechism describes, is a living relationship. Meaning, in our prayer, we're actually talking to God and God is talking to us. Now, often, and I, I, I've spoken to a number of you, but I've spoken to thousands of people over the years, and prayer is the most difficult thing, uh, a habit that they have in establishing in their daily life. We know how to pray together in liturgy. We know that. And, and students naturally do that. You know, they're far away from the church. They come into the church. They naturally like to gather, do the rosary together, mass together, to worship together. They know because they're being supported by, by each other. It's almost like, it's like we're together doing it. And it's easy to teach people to do that. But it's not easy to teach people how to sit with God and commune with him daily. But what, so it's almost like we think prayer is a mystical thing that only a few people really get it. And so we do our prayers, we say our prayers, but we don't really pray. So, as I described in the catechism, the church teaches us that prayer is relationship, building a relationship. Each one of us should go, ah, I know how to do that. Because that's what we do, do down here. We, we relate to each other. So, I'm going to suggest, and I have a little book that I wrote about how to do this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to suggest to each of you that there are five principles, and you can find them in the back of the catechism, that the principles are the same principles that are lived out in a relationship that I would have with a friend. So imagine, imagine I go to a coffee shop in the morning to meet a friend. What happens in that conversation, we can break it down because it's the exact same thing that unfolds in our prayer life when we sit down with God every morning. So, the first thing that happens. Oh, uh, sorry, I want to step back a little bit. There's one principle in relationship that we all understand. And that is, if I'm going to have a conversation with you, I speak to you, and I expect that you're listening. We know that it wouldn't be a, a very functional conversation if, if I was speaking to you, but I knew you weren't listening. Like, I would lose focus. I wouldn't feel like we're in a conversation. So we expect, if I'm speaking to you, that you're listening to me. And that your mind is forming thoughts and opinions and maybe some encouragement or a response to what I'm saying. So you're, you're thinking about what I'm saying, and then you're thinking, okay, how am I going to respond to this? And then you respond. You hear me, and you respond back, and I can hear you. Okay? Is that what happens in every conversation? That's what should happen in our prayer life. We should speak to God about what's going on. He hears us. He formulates thoughts, and then he speaks back to me, and I should be able to hear him every day. If it is a relationship. So the first thing that happens in a coffee shop um, is I go and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to it. Greet God. The first thing we should do when we sit down and pray is that we should greet God. First thing I do when I go to a coffee shop to meet somebody, what do I do? I pull up my hand and I shake their hand. And I say, Joe, how are you doing? Now, it's really important because what I'm doing is when I go to Joe and I shake his hand, I'm saying, I'm speaking to you. I'm meeting with you. I'm not meeting with everyone in the coffee shop. So when I greet somebody, I'm saying, hey, you and I are meeting. The same thing when I go and pray every morning. I should sit down and say, hey, by the way, I'm having a conversation with God. And so I should greet him. We do it as Catholics all the time, naming the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But when I'm saying about greeting God, I'm, I'm saying to greet him intentionally, meaning with thoughts in our mind that we're not just greeting God, but we're greeting the three persons in God. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because what that does is it kind of, it now it makes it relational. It's just not a spiritual thing. It's relational. I'm meeting with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And how I do that, when I sit down and pray, how I do that is I just turn my attention to the Father and I say, Father, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You love me. You hold me in the palm of your hand. Jesus, you are the son of the living God. You are, you are um, the one who suffered and died for me. Holy Spirit, you're my helper. What I've done is I've greeted the person I'm going to be talking to for the next while. It focuses our attention on the person. Now, what I'd like to do right now, for the next three minutes, I'm going to invite each of us to close our eyes. And I want you, actually, I'll give you two minutes. I want you to greet God. I want you to, um, and you don't have to have great language. You don't have to be, you know, articulate before him. You just have to direct your attention to the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So take a moment. Take 15 seconds with, with the Father. to say, Father, you created everything. You're awesome. Jesus, you're, you're my Savior. Holy Spirit, you're my helper. So I want you to close your eyes. And for the next minute or two, I'll let you know when. I want you to, and I, I want everyone to do this. Uh, and the reason I want you to do this is that if you do this, if you know how to commune with God, I can guarantee you that your children will learn how to be in relationship with him. So this isn't just for you, an exercise. This is something that you can pass on to your children. So you've got a minute, minute and a half to greet the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Close your eyes. Okay, I don't have a lot of time, but... But it's a principle that we should have as Catholics that we should be sharing what is happening in our prayer life with our spouse, with our children. In our household, it's a common thing to share with each other what God has been saying in our prayer life. It makes God tangible. It makes God is present daily and relevant daily. So be ready to share kind of what God is saying in your prayer life. Now, the, so the first principle is greeting God. The second principle that is found in all relationships, I'm going to the co coffee shop. The next thing that needs to happen in any relationship is to be honest. Now, think about it. What is going on in my life? I go to the coffee shop, I'm meeting Joe, and I say, hey, Joe, how are you doing? And he says, fine. I say, I'm stressed out. I mean, the traffic getting here is crazy. Or I'm stressed out because I, that interview this evening. Or I'm so excited, I just won the lottery last night. Meaning I'm sharing what is going on in my life because the conversation I'm going to have is going to be determined on what is actually going on in my life. Do you understand? How often do we go meet somebody and we go, Hey, how are you doing, Benoit? And what does Benoit say? Fine. Have you ever had that? Good. Great. Awesome. Couldn't be better. What you, like, your life is perfect? No, what you're doing by saying fine, perfect, great, excellent is... I don't really want to get personal with you. I'm just going to say, yeah, fine. Okay, good. Let's, let's go do our thing. If we want to determine how close we want the relationship, the conversation to go, will be determined on how honest I am in that conversation. Wouldn't you agree? That if I say, if I say to Benoit, I am really stressed out, or I'm really excited about what I'm seeing here, and I would love to bring my family, and unfortunately my family's struggling, and this and that. What am I saying to Benoit? He has access to my life, doesn't he, huh? 
When we go sit down with God, the first thing we should be doing, and the, and the church teaches it, that we should come to, to our, our prayer life as beggars. Meaning we should, the first thing I should be doing with God after I've greeted him is I should speak to him of where I'm at. Now what I do is I take out my journal and I, and I begin to, I always start my prayer life and telling him kind of, I don't get too much into the detail, but I let him know what's going on. And here are some of the things I would say to him. And I'm writing it. And I'm writing it to him. I say, and you might be able to relate. I so don't want to be here. <laughs> I, I feel so distracted or I'm so tired. So I just let him know kind of what's going on. Or I might say, Lord, I'm going to the Family Life Conference. And I'm very excited. But I'm a little intimidated because I have to give these talks. So I, I don't know what to say. Or I might say, Lord, I'm really struggling with a couple of my children. And I don't know what's going on. And, and I, I need your help. I don't get into a lot of detail. It's almost like I'm just saying, man, I'm stressed out. The traffic was crazy. I didn't explain what happened in the, in the traffic. I just let them know where I'm at. Now, what's going to happen here? Most of the time, it's been my experience, and I believe if God is relationship, that what I'm actually going through would be dealt with throughout my prayer. Or at least I'll put my heart in the right place where God can actually deal with it either throughout the day or whatever, however he wants to deal with it. So I'm telling him where I'm at. He's not disregarding it. You know, I'm not saying, Lord, I'm stressed out. And he says, hey, by the way, do you like my sacred heart? You know, what? You know, like, do you understand the disconnect? No, God wants to connect with us and where we're at. So what I'd like you to do right now for the next two minutes is I want you now to be honest with God. And to give some context I'm going to invite you for the next two. Actually, I might give you three minutes. And I want you to talk to God about something. And what I'd like you to talk to him about is what I've been saying. Meaning, I want you to say to him in the quiet of your own heart, but you're talking to him, you're saying, God, I have no idea what Andre is saying. Or, Lord, I'm really, really challenged by some of the things he's saying. Or, how, how do I pray like this? And, you know, like, I've never prayed like this or, you know. So I want you to kind of give him the initial response in your heart right now of what's going on right now as I'm speaking. So you might like it. You might not like it. You might be confused. It might be clear. Whatever, you're going to tell him what's going on. Don't get too deep. Just talk to him about what is going on in your heart, your reaction to my presentation. So you've got one to two minutes to now have a conversation about God of where you're at right now. So we've spent two minutes and, and in our own prayer time, this could be between two minutes and 10 minutes of greeting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we just spent three minutes Speaking to God about where we're at. Now, in our prayer time, when we journal this, this could be between, you know, three minutes and ten minutes. Meaning, we are already praying between five and fifteen minutes. A lot of people say, I can't sit for too long and pray. You guys just did it. We just have to learn how to be in conversation with God. You know, there's something the catechism says, and it's really important to understand, that the struggle in prayer is prayer itself. Because in a relationship, when I struggled to build a relationship with my wife, it's actually relationship building. We're not failing when we struggle in our prayer, when we're distracted and we're trying to get back. The only bad prayer time we'll have is the one that we don't show up to. God is not disappointed if we sit there and struggle for the amount of time that we pray. He'll be pleased because 
We're trying. So, greeting God, honest. Now, the third one is extremely important. And that is now to set our gaze. We, we, we're looking at our own heart. Now to set our gaze heavenward, meaning worship, adoration. This should define our prayer life. We, if, if we are not really worshiping God in our prayer, it makes it almost impossible to have a good, intimate, personal, transformative prayer life. The catechism says that worship and adoration is the quickest way to commune with God. Because what's happening in worship is that we're directing our gaze away from ourselves, away to, uh, to what's going on in our lives. And in a very intentional way, we're directing our thoughts to God and who he is and what he's done. But not just casually, but very actively and intentionally. You know, when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, teach us to pray. And he just didn't have a, okay, the Our Father, now pray that. No, there are principles in the Our Father that speak of prayer. Now, together, I want us to do the first third of the Our Father. So together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. What did we just did? What, do we, what, what did Jesus just say? One third of our prayer life should be worship. The Our Father, one third of the Our Father is directing our gaze to heaven. Now what worship does, like I said, is it moves my thoughts and my, my emotions in a very active way to heaven. And what happens is that when I say, God, you are almighty and all powerful, God doesn't become almighty and all powerful. He is almighty and all powerful. No, I'm the one that recognizes, I'm reminding myself, God, you are all powerful. You are wonderful. You're mercy. It's like when I say to my wife, you're so beautiful. She doesn't become more beautiful. It reminds me of who she is. So worship is so important. Because, again, when I direct my gaze to heaven, and I say, God, you are mighty. You're glorious. You hold me in the palm of your hands. You created the heavens and the earth. What happens is I begin to gain perspective of who God is and who I am. All my problems, not that they go away, but that they have a perspective. I remember when I was dating this girl and uh, she was awesome. She was beautiful. I, I, like I was so attracted to her and the relationship was going somewhere until she decided it wasn't. One day, she says, Andre, it's over. And I tried to drop to my knees and beg her, no. But she, she would not hear anything of it. Like, she made her decision. It was done. Have you ever had that experience? I was devastated. Like, I didn't have a case. I, I, she wouldn't listen to me. The relationship was over. My life was over. I mean, I lost perspective. I mean, what am I going to live for? I mean, if she's not there, life has no meaning. I mean, my mind was going crazy. But I remember someone saying that when things get difficult, direct your gaze to God and worship. And so I sat in my chair and I began to worship God. And so what was happening was, again, I was moving my, my body, my experience from all my emotions, which were pretty devastating at the moment, and they're directing them to God. And it's almost like, not that I was still heartbroken, but it didn't have the bite. It, it wasn't as devastating. It was almost like the load became lighter because I gained perspective. But also what worship does, and it's really important because it's hard to start praying. 
I pray an hour a day. And it's hard to motivate yourself to sit there and be there for an hour to get started. What worship does, and I've had this experience, well, I, I have this experience, you know, probably 50% of my time, times I go and pray, is that I find it hard to get started, to kind of enter into the, the, the moment. And so what, what God would tell me, he said, just start worshiping me. And so what would happen is I'd go, Father, you are the creator of heaven and earth. Father, you know, like you're mighty and, oh, I don't feel like doing this, but you are the king of kings. Jesus, you love me. And, you know, you, you created me and you, you, you hold me in the palm of your hand. And, and that, you know, Jesus, you died for me. As I'm worshiping, as I'm kind of actively praising God, it's like the Holy Spirit is grabbing me full, of, like with grace, and lifting me up into his company. What did, what did Mary do? You know, the Magnificat, huh? She began to worship God. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit just lifts us up into his company. And there we are. Now, now our gaze is upon him. So now I'm actually entering into my prayer life. So if you want to start, worship is a, is, is a great way to kind of disposition yourself before God. And the best way, especially when you're starting, is actually to go to the Psalms. Because what the Psalms are is worship. All the emotions that we have, fear, doubt, um, hope, joy, fear, the, the whole list of emotions are all found in the Psalms. But the Psalms, as the church teaches, is that it has this way of kind of moving our thoughts to, you know, the solution or the person that is going to lift us out of that pit or to, to share in our joys or to give us the courage we need or whatever it might be. The Psalms, as the church teaches, become our prayer. So when we read the Psalms, it's almost like we are, it's, it's words that we want to say to God. The Psalms are a great gift and the church gives it to us every day. A set of psalms that we can go to. And we know that the people throughout the world are reading these psalms. So what I'd like to do in this section. Do you guys have your, this book here? The, the, our um, program? Take out the program. If you don't, I, I will lead you. I want to enter into three minutes of worship. And what I mean by worship is I, I'm, I'm saying actively worshiping. Not just meditating on God, but actually as we read in the Psalms and in the readings, to, uh, in the Psalm today it says, let me take my glasses out. It's awesome. So today's Psalm, let me go to it. Where is it? Now I won't be able to find it. Oh, gee, I knew it. Okay, Sunday. The psalm 89, but someone read the first words of the psalm that we read out loud. I will sing forever the steadfast love of God. Almost all the psalms say, I will sing, I will shout, I will praise. Meaning we don't want to meditate we actually want to sing and, and praise and speak words. I don't want to just think my wife is beautiful. I want to tell her she's beautiful. And so uh, what I'd like you guys to do is using the psalm of the day. And I will read it if I can find it. Uh, for those that don't have the booklet. But if, if you have a telephone, you can go to mass readings. Daily mass readings and the psalm will be there. Okay. Page what? 12, thank you very much. There's always helpful people. 12, 12. There it is. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it. And I want you to try to remember it and then use those words. I'm going to give you two minutes to kind of be quiet in your own heart to worship God. Actively worship him. Say the words and kind of expand on the, the psalm that we read today. 
So I'm going to read it. And those that have it, you can, you can uh, in the two minutes, refer to this, uh, the psalm of the day. It's, so, I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. And I'm going to expand on it. Lord, I'm going to speak of your goodness because you are good. You're full of love. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You died for me. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for your goodness in my life. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. I know you'll be with me and my children forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Lord, I know that you and your your love and your goodness in my life is like a rock underneath my feet. I will not be shaken Blessed are the people who know the festival shouts, who walk. Oh Lord, I'm so thankful for what I've seen here. That your presence at this conference is so palatable. It's there. I thank you for it. And I ask that you would would always shine brightly in our hearts. See what I just did? The Psalms became the words of worship for me. So you have two minutes to find a way to speak praises of God. And if you can't remember... Just say the Our Father, the first third of the Our Father. You got two to three minutes to worship God. Close your eyes, direct your gaze to Him. Okay, I would love to give you more time, but I'm running out of it. Um, and so we've greeted God two to five minutes. We've been honest with Him three to five to seven minutes. We've worshipped, and this should really be something that you don't discard or shorten. If anything, you should lengthen this time of, of wor- in your prayer. If you spent your one hour just worshipping God, you've done a lot. Um, but this should take, you know, again, two to five minutes of your prayer. So now we're praying 15 to 20 minutes, and we're not done yet. So... The fourth aspect or principle of a a conversation is now I have to hear back from the person. And the church teacher makes it very clear that, you know, in prayer, we talk to him in the scriptures, he speaks back to us. You know what? We as Catholics have a great gift. Every day, God gives us a gospel that we all, it's almost like what God wants to say to the church every day. And if we go to the gospel, all the readings, we know God's intention, what he, what he wants to say to us that day. What he says to you and what he'll say to you in those gospels might be a little different. But I want to make a, a promise. And it is a promise because it's biblical and it's, it speaks of the heart of God and speaks of relationship. In the gospel, God is going to speak to what you need to hear. Sometimes it might be obscured, but we can believe that the word of God does not go and, and, you know, to its destination and come back void. Meaning it will accomplish what it's set out to do. The word of God is alive and active. So we go to the scripture knowing, and, and often we don't, like, I'm so excited to get to the gospel of the day. Because I believe with all my heart what God has. God has something to say to me that day. We should, we should go to the scripture with great anticipation. Because God is going to speak something to you. And it's often what you had talked about at the beginning. Kind of where I'm at. I would love to tell you a thousand stories. Of how the Lord has met me exactly where I'm at. Because he's for me. My prayer life is like one in one time with God himself. It's like he's discipling me, forming me. And the gospel is where we hear him the most powerfully. Now, we know we have a great gift in the church is Lexio Divina. So I'd like to go through it very quickly. And we don't have a lot of time to go here. But Lexio Divina is a great way. Some form of it is a great way to, to um, engage in the gospel of that day. Now, what you do is you just read the gospel and you read it, of course, asking for the Holy Spirit to be present. You read it and you allow the the scripture 
by the way, you're not a biblical scholar. This is often, I see this all the time, especially with students. They say, well, you know what this passage says? And they come, you know, they have a great, uh, you know, um, uh, explanation of, of, you know, the biblical uh, narrative, why Jesus would have said this in this context. No, what is he saying to you? And so it, it might stand out saying, um, I, I have called you by name. Or um, he went and he healed everyone. Or, um, you know, do not be afraid. And you read it and it st stands out for you. It stands out to you. And you just, okay, just allow it to stand out, okay? And then you go back a second time and say, Lord, based on what you're saying, speak to me clearly what you want to say to me today. It's important that you talk to him this way. You're not just reading the scripture as something you have to do. He's, it's, it's like a conversation. What, what did you mean there? When you said, you know, like you, you, you really like um, my, my jacket? Okay, explain more. What do you like about it? Do you understand? That's what happens in conversation. So if, Lord, what is it that you're really trying to say? And what happens when you go into that second round of reading it again? It's like it becomes very clear that he says, I've got you written on the palm of my hand. Lord, I came to this prayer time so stressed out. But you're telling me now that I'm written on the palm of your hand. So now, I'm not only speaking to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of reflecting on what he's just said. Yeah, you're right. This is a nice jacket. I love this jacket because it's comfortable. It makes me warm. Oh, you really like the shirt with that? I, I like it. It's my favorite shirt. Do you see what, what's happening here? In our prayer time, when, when he says, I, I got you written in the palm of my hand. Lord, tell me more about that. What do you mean? I don't feel like my uh, you're, you have me written on the palm of your hand. Give me the grace to kind of see it. And so I'm in conversation with God and, and the scripture is becoming alive. It's becoming his words to me. Now, we're not going to do it together because I've only got four minutes left. Okay? But you know what it's, what, how to do this. But this should take you five to ten minutes. So now you're not only praying like 15 to 20 minutes. You're pay, praying praying up to 40 minutes. The last aspect of your prayer, the fifth, is a resolution to do something. So if, if you know, in the prayer, in reading the scripture says, do not be afraid. I'm going to say, Lord, you've really spoken to me about not being afraid that you'll be with me this afternoon when I go to that interview. Give me the grace um, to, to, to not be afraid. And so, Lord, I'm actually, just before I go into that meeting, I'm going to read this passage. And I want you to speak it into me. So I have a resolution. I'm going to do something about what he just said to me. And that takes one to two minutes. And I often journal that. So we greet God. We come to him in honesty. Tell him where we're at. Three, we worship him. Direct our gaze to him. Four, we, he speaks back to us in the scriptures. Five, we have a resolution. We, we act upon what he has spoken to us. I encourage you to, it doesn't have to be exactly the way I just spoke to you, but to, to be parents of prayer, especially you men. Because if our children see us actually praying in relationship with God, which that's what the church... God doesn't just want us to say prayers. He wants us to commune with him. Our children be more likely to pray. So if you are interested, I have a number of these books. It'll help you remember. They're only $3 a, a copy. They're a great tool for you, but also you could sit down with your children because my 17-year-old, my, uh, she taught her group, her friend group, how to pray by using the booklet. She didn't just talk generally about prayer, but she sat down with them and did what I just did with you guys. 
So if you're interested, uh, I have 10 here, but we also have um, quite a few at the tent. Thank you very much um, for uh, engaging today. Um, it's been a blessing to be here. Uh, I'm very encouraged. I, I want to take what you guys are doing here, because I'm from Saskatchewan, but living in Ottawa. I apologize. But I want to bring what you guys are doing here to Ottawa, because I think it's a great gift to the church. Thank you very much, and God bless.